Welcome to this edition of CBN News Showcase. I'm Charlene Aaron. And I'm Mark Martin. This week, United States Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy announces his retirement, sending a ripple effect through Washington and America. It could be the biggest political fight of the year in the nation's capital with so much at stake with Kennedy's replacement. We begin now with CBN's Heather Sells on how all sides are preparing for an epic confirmation battle. Kennedy played a crucial role on the court, often providing the key swing vote when the other eight justices were split. The president noted his influence at a North Dakota rally Wednesday night. The travel ban ruling underscores just how critical it is to confirm judges who will support our Constitution. Ronald Reagan nominated Kennedy in 1987 after his first two choices failed. Kennedy will likely be remembered for his gay rights decisions. In 2015, he wrote the majority decision giving gay couples the right to marry. He also voted to uphold Roe v. Wade in a challenge to abortion in 1992. His retirement gives the president a second judicial pick in two years and an opportunity to do what many of his supporters have hoped for, the ability to shape the court for years to come. And I'm very honored that he chose to do it during my term in office because he felt confident in me to make the right choice and carry on his great legacy. The political fight over Kennedy's successor is already looming large. The Senate must confirm the president's nominee, but Democrats are protesting, saying the vote must wait till after the midterm elections. Our Republican colleagues in the Senate should follow the rule they set in 2016, not to consider a Supreme Court justice in an election year. But the Republican Senate leader says there will be no delay. We'll vote to confirm Justice Kennedy's successor this fall. If Republicans unite behind a Trump nominee, there's little the Democrats can do. New Senate rules forbid filibustering on Supreme Court nominees, so only 51 votes will be required for confirmation. CBN's Eric Rosales in Washington has more on who the president might pick. With the news of Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy's retirement, President Trump has already created a short list of candidates. Each prospective nominee has the potential of shifting the ideological balance of the court ever farther to the right for decades to come. Different conservative groups contributed both ideas and suggestions to the list that, Senator, uh, that President Trump uh, is going to use. And the principles that are common among all the people on the list are traditional conservative principles. Justice Kennedy often provided the swing vote in liberal decisions like legalizing same-sex marriage and upholding Roe v. Wade. Heritage Foundation senior legal fellow Thomas Chipping says among the potential replacements is Amy Barrett, a judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. There's also a former clerk to Justice Kennedy in the running. Brett Kavanaugh, who is a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals here in Washington. He's been there for more than a dozen years, very experienced. Another name on the list is Georgia Supreme Court Judge Britt Grant, a member of the Federalist Society and only 40 years old, which would make her one of the youngest Supreme Court justices ever. Hours after the announcement, some headed to the steps of the Supreme Court. It's going to give Donald Trump another opportunity to pack the court with extremely conservative uh, justices, and so we're not we're going, we're out here to kind of push back against that. That could be a wasted effort, according to CNN legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin, who tweeted, "Anthony Kennedy is retiring. Abortion will be illegal in 20 states in 18 months." Hashtag #Scotus, a move that concerned women for America hope to see. You want there to be a constitutionalist appointed because they believe in the Constitution as it was written. Um, it's not that they think it's a living, breathing document that will say whatever they want it to say based on feelings. Other conservative groups like Americans for Prosperity and the Judicial Crisis Network already announced that they plan to spend at least a million dollars on the looming battle to replace Justice Kennedy. They want, quote, a nominee in the mold of Neil Gorsuch. Eric Rosales, CBN News, outside the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court handed pro-lifers a major victory, ruling that a California law forcing crisis pregnancy centers to inform patients about abortion as an option violates the Constitution. CBN's Ben Kennedy has more on the court's decision. 
Well, there was no doubt a victory for pro-life after the Supreme Court ruled that in the Golden State, pregnancy centers no longer have to advertise for abortions. Oh, we are so happy today. We're delighted with this victory. They will no longer be forced into speech, and it's a victory for the women who go to these, um, to these pregnancy resource centers. The law required pregnancy centers to tell clients abortions are available at little or no cost. The mostly Christian-based centers felt the law forced them to deliver a message against their beliefs. We know the reality is Planned Parenthood and NARAL, as you can hear, they're leading an all-out assault on these life-affirming centers. Women. Women. Opponents argue women must be told about all available options. Women, we cannot have full freedom without autonomy over our body, and that means abortion rights. Now, the ruling was close, 5-4. What does that tell you? I think it just tells me that the issue, you know, one of the issues involved women and abortion, and perhaps those on the left um, wanted to be on the other side with regard to what the specific issue is. But overall, this ruling is broad in that it affirms precedent that says all Americans have the right to express messages consistent with their convictions. Now the ruling goes into effect right away, and it could also affect similar laws in other states. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Washington. Another big decision handed down by the nation's high court gave a big victory to the Trump administration. The court ruled in favor of the extreme vetting immigration policy, better known as a travel ban for some Muslim nations. CBN's Dale Hurd explains what it will mean. This was a major win for Donald Trump, just as opponents saw it as a dark day for America. Moments after the decision, President Trump tweeted, Supreme Court upholds Trump travel ban. Wow. That's a very strong victory. The court ruled that the president has the power to regulate immigration. Constitutional law professor Dr. Bradley Jacob says this wouldn't have been a court case had it not been for the president's comments on the campaign trail. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. If you look at the policy, just the policy, you say, of course it's constitutional. Of course it's legal under the statute. There's absolutely nothing wrong. It's the fact that while he was campaigning, he was giving speeches about how he was going to ban Muslims. He was going to keep Muslims out of this country. Well, the Constitution tells us you can't treat people differently just because of their religious views. Justice Sotomayor, who opposed the ban, said the administration created the strong perception that the ban is contaminated by impermissible bias against Islam and its followers. But the ban does not restrict travel from the world's largest Muslim nations and also includes two non-Muslim nations, North Korea and Venezuela. Yet Muslim groups treated it as a blanket ban on all Muslims entering the country. What this means for my community as a Muslim right now is that we don't belong here. We're not allowed in this country. Shame on you to take us back decades ago to the dark ages. Just minutes after the ruling, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell shared this image on Twitter of himself shaking hands with Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, who voted to uphold the ban. McConnell blocked the nomination of former Obama Supreme Court nominee Merrick Garland in 2016 which allowed President Trump to nominate Gorsuch. I think perhaps the most important thing a president does in most cases is appoint members of the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary generally. Uh, It is is a, a function that will impact our nation for decades. As one legal expert put it, even if you don't like Donald Trump, if you're conservative, be thankful that he's picking judges. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Coming up, the president of the Philippines calls God stupid and sets off a tidal wave of reaction. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte's statement calling God stupid for allowing sin to destroy creation offended and outraged many Christians worldwide. Now church leaders are expecting that God will bring something good out of the controversy. Lucia Tolusan has the story from Manila. Brother Eddie Villanueva, founder of one of the largest Christian churches in the Philippines, together with other church leaders, have made an appeal to President Duterte to make a public apology to God. This, he says, is part of correcting the president in love. 
mocking God, slandering God, would invite the wrath of God, not only for himself, but even for the nation being the head of the country. Who is this stupid God? Aside from the scandalous stupid God remark by Duterte, Pastor Villanueva also expressed concern over ungodly policies approved by the Duterte administration. When the policy of the government is right, we are obligated to support. But when the policy or program is anti-God, like the uh, railroading of Sogi Bill, absolute divorce, and the deliberation right now of same-sex marriage, I absolutely believe no genuine Christian should support this. While offended Christians are praying for Duterte, an initiative by the president seems to be turning this dark situation into something positive. For the first time, a team formed by President Duterte had a dialogue with the leaders of the evangelical churches. The leaders are happy because they see this as a reconciliatory effort on the part of the president. What seemed to be intended for evil is now turning out to be for good. To be in crisis is not about religion or doctrine, it's about relationships, about the restoration of relationships. We cannot separate that state from God and the president needs to interact with the religious leaders. Uh, in order that we can uh, chart the better future for this nation. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Manila. Most Americans probably think they'll never have to personally get involved in the battle over gay marriage in our nation. Well, that's what County Clerk Kim Davis in Kentucky thought. Then the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage, and she found herself right in the center of controversy. CBN's Paul Strand tells us why she believes many more Christians will also end up there. Kentucky's Carter County Detention Center has a unique claim. It's the first place that any American in history has ever been put behind bars for taking a stand for one man, one woman marriage. Growing up here, Kim Davis usually kept to herself, reading her Bible and praying each morning. Certainly not the type you would expect to become the face of a national fight over marriage. I hate confrontation and it was something that was definitely outside my comfort zone. Every marriage license that came out of this Rowan County Courthouse had Kim Davis's name on it and her authority associated with it. Now, as a Christian, she believed what the Bible said, that God defined marriage as a union of one man and one woman. For me, this has never been a gay or a lesbian issue. This has been about standing up for the Word of God. In her new book, Under God's Authority, Davis tells how the Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage forced her to take a stand. Rowan County wouldn't issue any marriage licenses as long as her name remained on them. Davis's lawyer, Matt Staver of Liberty Council, compares her action to others in Kentucky. If you object to hunting, you have the ability to opt out of giving a hunting license based upon your conscience. But up until this case, you weren't able to opt out of issuing same-sex marriage licenses. Davis's refusal to authorize marriage licenses led gay rights activists to descend on this courthouse, demanding the licenses, often angrily. I was having some really fiery, hot, and hard darts thrown at me. Davis was soon encountering dozens of rage-filled activists outside the courthouse and even inside the clerk's office, many yelling and screaming, all of it aimed at her and her deputies. And they had bullhorns. They would walk up about two feet from my window and yell, do your job, do your job. As the days passed, protesters became more aggressive and dangerous. I got death threats here over the phone, through email, uh, U.S. mail. Uh, FedEx packages, uh, glitter bombs. And threats were very explicit. Someone would come in, uh, tie her up, rape her in front of her husband, kill her husband and burn their house down. A few weeks after taking her stand, a judge in this federal building ordered Davis to resume granting marriage licenses and demanded she convince him why she should not be held in contempt. In the book, Davis says although she tried, the judge labeled her religious reasons for not complying with his order simply insufficient. Then. The judge stunned both sides, Kim, her legal team, and the opposing legal team, by instead of talking about fines for her contempt, he went straight instead to talk of jail time. Davis wouldn't back down, so it was off to the Carter County Detention Center. As Kim was being sent here, famous Christians were reacting with outrage. Mike Huckabee called it an unbelievable moment in American history. And he asked, who's next? Pastors, florists, caterers, who else goes to jail before this is over?
unconscionable. It goes against everything that this country is founded upon. I had a sense of peace. I got rest. Oddly enough, Davis found her time in cell 151 okay. God was right there with me. And she would still be there now if she had to be. Since Rowan County deputy clerks finally resumed issuing marriage licenses while she was jailed, the judge released her after six days. She walked out to a huge rally held by supporters. While Davis is happy to be free, she knows there will be other cases like hers. I want people to know that it's not if it happens, but when it happens. When we're in that position, are we going to blink or are we going to stand true to the Lord? Well, Kim Davis and Matt Staver warned this fight over marriage is the defining cultural battle of our time. And those who want to redefine marriage don't just want you to acquiesce, but accept and approve their new definition. And if you won't, your religious liberty could be in just as much danger as Kim's was. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Rowan County Courthouse, Moorhead, Kentucky. Still ahead, unrest in Iran as the nation's economy is in turmoil. How Israel is working to help the people take a stand against the regime. For several days in a row this week, thousands of Iranians took to the streets of Tehran to demonstrate against their government. That's right. They're protesting deteriorating economic conditions. CBN's Chris Mitchell reports on how Israel is using social media to support the people. Social media video documented the protest. Shopkeepers shut down Tehran's Grand Bazaar. Others filled the streets near Iran's parliament where police shot tear gas into the crowds. Some shouted, leave Syria, think about us. These demonstrators even shouted, death to Palestine. Mike Ansari of Mohabbat TV told CBN's George Thomas the dissatisfaction of Iranians runs deep. Of course, Iranian families are facing great economic hardship. The prices of milk, eggs, meat, bread has skyrocketed. Yet Iranian people are witnessing the government investing millions of dollars in expensive, uh, you know, regional disputes uh, in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, to increase its regional influence while they're going hungry. Iran's economy is reeling. Prices are rising. The currency is falling and has lost almost half its value in six months. Now the economy is bracing for renewed sanctions after the U.S. pulled out of the nuclear deal with Tehran. In the midst of these demonstrations, Israeli leaders spoke directly to the Iranian people. Israel's defense minister asked them where their money is going, while Prime Minister Netanyahu turned to the World Cup and to soccer. Can you imagine how hard it is to stop Ronaldo from scoring a goal? But the Iranian team just did the impossible. To the Iranian people, I say, you showed courage on the playing field, and today you show the same courage in the streets of Iran. It's unclear where these demonstrations will end up, but some hope they could eventually lead to a regime change. No dictatorship stands for a long period of time, even if they disguise themselves with so-called free election. Uh, it will happen, maybe in a year, maybe in five years, may maybe in decades. The question is how much damage this regime would cause until it will disappear from Earth. One day I'll hope to watch Iran's soccer team go head-to-head -head against Israel in a free Tehran. On that day, We'll all be winners. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge, made history this week as the first British royal to ever visit Israel and the Palestinian areas. CBN's Julie Stahl has a look at his three-day visit from our Middle East Bureau. Prince William spent much of his trip meeting with regular Israelis and Palestinians, particularly young people. I'm also struck by how many people in the region want a just and lasting peace. This is only too evident among the young people I have met who long for a new chapter to be written in the history of this region, a chapter which will secure them a prosperous future and will ensure that their enormous talents can flourish. These are not extravagant aspirations, but the same aspirations of young people everywhere in the world. The prince shares a special connection with the Jewish people. His great-grandmother Alice, who is buried on the Mount of Olives, is recognized as a righteous Gentile for saving a family during the Holocaust. The official certificate in our memorial uh, Yad Vashem, yes. which we visited, uh, for uh, Princess Alice, great spirit, great son. The visit also comes at a time when Palestinians are at odds with the U.S. over President Trump's move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem 
and a perceived bias in favor of Israel. Prince William's message to Israelis and Palestinians was the same. I know I share a desire with all of you and with your neighbors for a just and lasting peace. The prince visited Jerusalem's old city, prayed at the Western Wall, and met with government leaders. President Reuven Rivlin asked the prince to play a role in communicating with the Palestinian leadership. I would like you to send him a message of peace and tell him it is about time. It is about time that we have to find together the way to build confidence. He got that chance a day later, meeting with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. I hope it won't be the last visit, and we hope that you will visit us very soon when the Palestinian people get their independence. The British have a long history in the Middle East, and while this is the first royal visit, it's not likely to be the last. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Maybe per Prince will bring his family the next time he visits. That's right, who knows? Great. Maybe he will. <laughs> well, up next, we're gonna pray through the headlines here on Showcase. Stay with us. Won't you join us now as we pray? Dear Lord, we simply ask that your will be done in the headlines around America and the world. We pray for wisdom for our nation to carry out the laws from Congress and decisions handed down by the Supreme Court. As one justice retires, we pray for wisdom for the president as he chooses the next nominee. And we pray by your mercy that our leaders would do what's best for the nation and not what is best for their political leanings. Father God, we pray for the people of the Philippines and their leader, especially that he would know you, Lord God, and repent for the foolish things he said about you. And Lord, we pray for the people of Iran. We pray that you would deliver them from a selfish dictator and deliver them from these difficult times. And most of all, that you would continue to build your church in Iran. We pray, Lord, for Prince William, Lord God, as his visit to Israel concludes. Lord, bless the royal family with more of your presence in their lives. We also conclude right now praying for revival across our nation and the world to the glory of your kingdom, that none would perish but have eternal life. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Well, that's all for this edition of the CBN News Showcase. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about. That's at CBNNews.com. Stay up to date with CBN News through Facebook and Twitter. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a wonderful day.